folks, here it is. The final episode of the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. Z Lost Episode Trilogy. Oh, okay. I I was a bit confused as to what we were doing. <laughs> so this is just the third of those three lost right. episodes. That's right. We've harpooned the final white whale that swam beyond our grasp. Oh, take my final episode back. Dune Steve lost episodes. Uh, got you talking smack. We could sing right now if you just warm up your heart for me. <laughs> sing, my little biggie. Oh, boy. Rish Outfield, so pathetic bet, it'd be funny if it wasn't so sad. I, I bet probably 90% of the folks who haven't listened to any of the stories of the last episode, they're just like, okay, that's enough for me. Click. Huh. Oh, that's too bad. After all the time it took to get them onto the show. Oh, well, we'll be back again next week without singing, so tune in there, folks. Well, that might be a promise that I can't make, but it won't be off the top of the show at least. Take it away. You take it away. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Fine, Pierce. You win it. Just kill us and end this. Oh, no. Killing's too good for you. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. Cast shape change on Duquesne. <gasps> and Rish Outfield. What shape do you choose for him? Fair. Anaconosis Anaconosis now Yeah, welcome everybody to the Dune <clears throat> Welcome everybody to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine You better uh, get them ready for funny voices Ah, uh, yes. Oh, yeah. This is Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich, and you're listening to episode 97. Okay. Thank you for joining us. That's right. And today's story is... Today's story is a fun little number. What is it called? It, well... <sighs> It's funny because I checked with the author because the story has kind of a strange name. Uh, Dizzy Dean, Daffy Dean. I always tell them that I'm their cousin, Goofy. Uh, so anyways, I asked him, how do you pronounce the name? Is, is there a certain way to pronounce it? Or But he did say he was happy with whatever it is that we came up with. So yeah, today's story is, this is what we came up with, Anacoinosis by Tobias S. Buckle. He shoots. He scores. You know, I, I think you may be mispronouncing part of his name. I believe his middle initial is pronounced S. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Okay. Anyways, yes, the story is Anacoinosis by Tobias S. Bakel. And now a word about the author. Tobias Bakel was born in the Caribbean in Grenada. Is it Grenada or Grenada? We say Grenada here, Whitey. Now give me 20. <laughs> I think we're allowed to pronounce anything however we want, so... So, uh, okay. Caribbean, then? Uh, yes. <laughs> he was born in the Caribbean in Grenada. Grenada, sorry. Grenada. We'll compromise. <laughs> He's lived in the U.S. since 1995 in Ohio. Ohio. It turns out his last name is pronounced Buckel, not Buckle. Oh, he's related to Superman in some way. Where it's like Zor L <laughs> and right. Jor L and, and Buck L. He graduated from Bluffton University in 2000 and is a professional blogger and SF author. Tobias has uh, several books you can get Crystal Rain, Ragamuffin, Sly Mongoose. He's, Crystal Rain. <laughs> he's written a Halo book. The Cole Protocol, and also has a short story collection called Tides. And you may also recognize Tobias Bakel from several appearances on Escape Pod. <laughs> We'd like to thank Marshall Latham for producing today's story. And Why do you always bring up Marshall Latham? Marshall, Marshall, Marshall! <sighs> Never gets old, does it? Wait, it started as old. Check out the links in the show notes. Anacoinosis by Tobias S. Bakel. 
Days ago, my aerocrat left me at the edge of the forest. Now, I ran back towards the break in the thick, tall woods, hoping to find him again. I wanted to return to his safety and bondage. The sun fell behind the knobby trees, and heavy clouds killed the light. Rain exploded through the leaves, drenching the world in so much darkness and moisture I could hardly breathe. Before long, I fell down and crawled on my hands and feet, slimy with mud, leaves and sticks plastered to my thin clumps of fur. I felt very alone, trying to find my way home. The trees loomed over me, threatening in the darkness. Creaks, snaps, and the sounds of animals skittering around in the darkness scared me. Stumbling around in the night, I found a burrow in the space between a large root and the moist ground. Dirt caked my hands as I dug in for the night. Overhead, streams of water cascaded down through the large leaves and drooping limbs to soak me. It would be a shivery night. My fur was only just starting to regrow after the anachoinosis. I wasn't sure what to do next. There was no advice or past memories to guide me on my path. It would be a shameful, lonely night, devoid of new learning. When I was born, I broke free of my shell with my own hands. I picked the insides clean until I had a full stomach and the brittle remains fell apart easily with a few punches and kicks. I remembered this as I remembered all things from long ago and far away. Many toys stood around me when I broke free. They were pale and twice my height, with disgustingly smooth skin. The only visible fur grew on their heads. Yet what fascinations they brought! Until this point, all the memories of my parents had swirled around through my body, mixing and intermingling, growing with me as I knit myself from egg. So I understood what they said when they looked at me. Many of my parents understood their languages. Though it had taken fifteen generations of anachoinosis to spread those memories all throughout, none of my kind could absorb Aerocratois memories not the way our own foreparents' memories were etched in each of us. The Aerocratois defied true understanding because of their alienness. So we observed, watched, and learned to imitate the Aerocratois ways. Maybe, we thought, if we imitated them long enough, we could come to understand them without anachoinosis. Bob! One of the Aerocratois pointed at me. This is your Whiffet. My what? It'll be your assistant. Bob, I knew from the memories, looked upset. Assistant? I don't want one of your little slaves. I want nothing to do with this. Another Aerocratois stepped forward. It is merely indentured servitude. Look. The leaders of the Wiffets gave us their young willingly in exchange for the technology we gave them. It's a fair trade. The memory of the Aerocratois descending from the sky on a loud wind popped into my mind. They came with gifts, glittering objects, rare metals, strong spear tips for better hunting, and diagrams for even more interesting machines. That doesn't make it okay! Bob shouted. It's wrong. You know it. Just because they were given to us doesn't make using them right. The conversation and my new master's concern made me nervous. I walked forward and grabbed his hand. I formed words. I will serve you well, Aerocrat. You will teach me all I can absorb. Bob's mouth hung open. How can it learn to speak so soon? The other Aerocratois <laughs> made <laughs> laughter noises and shook themselves. Uh. 
They learn in the egg, we think. You think? Bob shouted. Why haven't we thawed out anthropologists yet? This needs to be studied, to be learned. I was excited. I would understand new things, things my foreparents had not known. Very few of the Erocratois seemed to care about learning. They had a desperate air about them, and only cared about one thing, the Great Repair. But this Aerocrat seemed different. We don't have time, the others told Bob. The repairs must continue if we want to make the launch window. We have to fix the ship first, then we can study the Wiffets with whatever time we have left. We can leave the scientists behind. They made <laughs> laughed again. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be all right by me, one of them said. <laughs> me too. Yeah. To hell with those guys. I stood and watched them all. That was the day I was bonded to my aerocrat. The cycle of learning new things continued. Huddled under the root of the tree in the steady rain by myself, I sorted through long buried and a few recent happy memories. They comforted me. More of my fur had grown in by morning. I took a few moments to carefully groom myself with twigs, trying to comb over the few bare patches still left in my fur. It was the fourth time I'd lost and regrown my fur. I was proud of the memories I imparted to each of my children with every new generation I sired. The mud hadn't dried, but it was walkable. Outside the tree line, Bare ground stretched for miles and miles. Big yellow machines roved over the roads, driven by Erocratois inside. The yellow machines shoveled and ate dirt. They burrowed into the ground, sniffing for metal. Then the metal got taken back to the hopper, which digested metal in huge fiery belches and created spare parts for the great repair. The bare ground of the Erocratois had spread outward quickly. When the first of us were taken over the ocean to work here, there were only trees and the hopper. Whiffets clung to the backs of the yellow machines waiting for their orders. Others walked along the roadsides with picks, keeping the roads in good order. More worked deep in the earth, their fur thick with dirt, pulling metal from the ground. I knew every inch of the land. From generations back, the memories swirled inside me. Sometimes, I remembered the land across the sea my kind came from. It was very similar, but without wild animals, aerocratois, or big yellow machines. Time to walk the many miles of road back towards my aerocrat's home. My aerocrat looked down at me. I stood on the steps to his small hut. His eyes looked puffy, and the fur on top of his head was unkempt. I extended my forearm to show him the numbers on it. NN-721. The fur didn't grow around those markings. Bob flinched. He recognized me now. Oh, God, he said. I helped you run away. I freed you. What are you doing here? His voice sounded like an angry hiss. I flinched. No, no, no. Bob stepped back. I won't hurt you. I am back. I was happy to be back and in the presence of Erocratois again. But why? Bob shook his head. Do you know what it took for me to get you out there? I gave him the Erocratois gesture of understanding. I nodded. You, and I recalled it exactly, faked a pass to use a flyer to drop me off far so I could get far away from this hellhole of bondage. It had been an exciting adventure, and now I was back. Bob leaned towards the side of the doorway and repeatedly hit his head against it. I watched trying to understand his actions. I walked over next to him and did the same. 
Some ritual of returning? Bob stopped and looked around. Get inside, he ordered. He closed the door behind me quickly. Didn't I drop you far enough away so you could get away from all this? Bob moved to the back of his hut and mixed different colored liquids together from elaborate jars into a glass. His face twisted when he lifted the glass and swallowed. <sighs> Oof. The liquids must not have tasted very good. Bob drank things that didn't taste very good often. Yes, you did drop me far enough away, I said. Then why have you come back? How can I leave my master? You guide me, teach me, and command me. I would learn more new things, things not in my memory. The moment I came out of the egg, I had become bound to him. This was our way. Bob drank more liquids. We're missing each other, I think, he said. We don't understand each other. I was excited. Yes, we must understand. He grabbed my hand. Come on, we're going out. Bob took me to the graves. Tiny white crosses spilled out over the hill like strange saplings. In just two years since we first came to this planet, look at all the whiffets worked to death. He swept his arm at them. I looked at the hill, thinking of all the four parents there. Many of their memories swirled through me like a storm. They were not lost. Their memories were all over the place in other whiffets working for the Aerocratois. They are remembered. I looked up at Bob. What is your complaint? You are being exploited. Bob walked around in circles. It is bad. Why? I sat on the bare ground. What else would you have us do now that we are here, an ocean away from our homeland? <laughs> Bob's lips moved but nothing came out for several seconds. It's not just you, Bob said. That is bad enough, but we are also destroying ourselves. Bob crouched next to me and put his head in his hands. Losing our self-sufficiency and innovation. You know, the other day, one of the trucks broke, and instead of fixing it, they chose to build a wagon pulled by whiffets. It's easier and quicker than spending time trying to figure out how to fix the truck. Bob looked at me. It'll keep going like that. First, we used you to serve tired workers drinks and get into small areas we can't. You know, they said it was better to relocate the robots into dangerous areas. We needed more help than just the people we'd unfrozen. But soon, they will use your labor to replace other things. We'll be taking away the greenhouses and, and using whiffets out in the fields to grow crops. And then, when the robots break down, you'll be doing that work, too. A thrill shot up my back. All these new things we would be doing. This is wonderful. I stood up. You came from the sky and blessed us with all these new things. And now you tell me you will give us more? Bob pushed his fingers through his hair. You make things worse thinking like that. He pointed down at the direction of the hopper. The great legs poked out. Smoke rose from its pipes. The maw gleamed with fire. We were just passing by this system when our ship's shield failed. We were moving so fast, the interstellar dust just ripped through the hull. Half of the passengers died, and hardly anything of use survived. This was the best place they could find on short notice. The engineers dropped down planet side near the best resource-rich area they could find. They think the hopper can manufacture enough of the parts they need. He pointed up at the sky where the Aerocratois came from. They say we can, but I don't think they're going to be able to fix the damage. It's been two years and we're hardly any closer, and the hopper is beginning to show signs of failure. Bob poked at the dirt. There are many more passengers in storage up there that they're going to have to bring down before more life support systems fail on the ship. That's why they're making the roads and buildings. Temporary housing. More? More Aerocratois? I jumped up. This is marvelous. I wanted to share this new information, 
to ask if I could leave again, but Bob heard sounds from the tiny machine on his hand and sighed. <sighs> Time to work. Bob directed teams of Whiffets. We built huts for the Aerocratois. It was long, hard work. Others around me, their fur thick, clumping, and ready for anachoinosis, talked with me as we sawed wood and hammered the buildings into shape. Even though I could talk to other Whiffets while I worked, we all knew this did not bring true understanding. For us, speech was just a shadow of the truth. Only through constant anachoinosis could we truly be a community and know what lay in each other's hearts through the shared memories of our foreparents. Because we could not understand the Aerocratois, we were happily there to work, observe, and struggle to understand them. And Bob had told me interesting new things. Bob kept me out of sight. He let me work with other whiffets, but then hid me in his hut at night. He was worried about other Aerocratois realizing I had returned. They might decide to do something to you, Bob said. Some of the men are worried that one day the Whiffets will start running away. Do not worry, I said. We will not leave your side. <sighs> that did not make Bob relax. It made him drink more of his different colored liquids. It took several days of work before Bob talked to me about leaving again. My fur had thickened considerably and was full of healthy clumps. Bob and I sat at his table. He turned away my attempts to cook dinner for him or mix his funny liquids. I asked Bob if he would let me leave again. Won't you just come back? Yes, I said. Where are you going? Bob stood up and looked out the window. How long? I was excited. Anachoinosis, I will share what I have learned about your ships in the sky and your prediction of more of your kind coming to live among us. Bob's voice sounded like it was cracking. You will not try to escape then? I could not do that, I told him. He shook his head. What is this anachoinosis? The men told me you mean sex, Bob said. I stared at him blankly. Reproduction, Bob continued. I grabbed his hand. I will show you what it is. In all my memories, in the last two years, and so many generations of Whiffets since the sky broke and Aerocratois came among us, I don't think any of the Aerocratois had taken the time to understand what anachoinosis really was. They were too busy worrying about the great repair and how to feed the hopper with metal. Two years was not long to them. Bob followed me out of his hut. A small group met on the far side of a hill an hour's walk from the lights and buildings. They didn't know what to think about Bob, but I talked to them gently until they agreed to let him stay. Bob sat in the grass and watched. One of the four Whiffets still had patchy fur, but he was excited. He had learned how to operate one of the yellow machines by looking in through the windows at the Aerocrat toys while they operated it. It would have been better to wait until his fur was thick, but he was in a dangerous job. I chose him. The other three faced each other, a triple act of anachoinosis. I turned away from them and grabbed the arms of the other. His tattoo was NL-501. I leaned forward and brushed my cheek against his, hugged him, and felt my skin stir. He smelled of machinery, aerocratois, and dirt. I slowly began to molt as we held each other tight. The fur on my arms and chest intermingled with his. We rotated, pushed our backs against each other, then rubbed our legs together. Fur sloughed off, responding to touch, and drifted into a compact ball on the ground. 
Naked, we both sat next to the new egg and watched it bind itself tight. The loss of fur made me very hungry and tired. I let go of 501 and walked over to Bob, who sat very still. Explain this to me. I could barely hear his voice as I sat next to him. We watched the trio standing over by their own egg. This child, when it matures, will have both the memories and understandings of my insights with you and the insights of learning how to operate the yellow machines, I tell Bob. That is anachoinosis, true understanding. The egg will be brought to our masters, and they will choose who to bind the children to, as that will let them learn more than I could ever teach them. They know everything that I have known. But these are your children! Bob was loud now. He got up and walked in slow circles again. They are us. I followed him around in circles. They will be bound. They will be paired with those who know different things. If you had been one of us before you died, we would share anachoinosis, so your knowledge would not be lost, and the memories of those after us increase. Only after our masters die are we free and alone. Bob's mouth hung open. He was trying hard to understand. It was the closest an aerocrat could get to anachoinosis. It must be a survival mechanism. You co-mingle to pass on all your knowledge. Your fur... He stopped and ran his hand over my bare skin. It's protein, right? The, the DNA must combine. They... I don't know. He looks up into the sky. I cannot believe they decided against unfreezing anyone to study you all. We need the scientists down here. A new thought caught him, and he whirled on me. What happens to you when there are no new masters with new memories? When you share all? I spread my arms. Those are happy times, I said. I remember generations of pleasant times in the woods, times when you knew from all your prior foreparents' memories which trees could produce fruit every year. How many could gather in a copse and not go hungry? The feel of the sun on bare skin by the coast. Communal anachoinosis of hundreds together. Stasis for thousands and thousands of generations with no new ideas to be found. These are not happy times, Bob said. These are learning times. I pointed at the hopper. We must learn everything you can teach us, and then, when there is nothing more to learn, we can have happy times. We will be just like you. Bob shook his head. It won't work like that. It won't. But it will. It always has. In memory, there were other threats. Great predatory animals, others of my kind who knew very different things who came from different parts of the land we lived on before you took us away. We incorporate them, become them, reflect them, remember them, their thoughts and their essence. We will do the same to you. Bob walked away from me. I ran to catch up with his long strides. There is never stasis with humans. His feet hit the ground hard. We always change. Then we will learn this, and... Not as long as you consider us different, or masters of any knowledge. You will always be bound. And since we have longer lifespans than you, you will be bound forever. I could barely keep up with him. Well, yes, eventually, your young will need to become bound to us if they are to learn new things. Bob stopped. Say what? I smiled happily and said nothing. We can't share memories with you. Bob's hands waved in the air. Humans barely understand and agree with each other. We will come to be just like each other. That is how things must work. We will become just like you. And once we are just like you, you will be just like us. We will do all the same things to each other. Bob looked down at the ground. Oh, God. He rubbed his forehead. 
you might just do that. He walked in silence back to his home, me right by his side. Inside he made liquids and drank them late into the night, while I watched. He shook. <laughs> it was not laughter, but something else. His eyes watered over. When he thought I had fallen asleep, he picked up a blanket and spread it over me. I think we fucked up real bad here with it, he said, his voice slurred and funny sounding. And I don't know how to stop this mess. I just don't know how. My aerocrat became strange. He avoided me, refused to let me work, and he stayed out late. That went on for many nights. It seemed like he was trying to induce anachoinosis in the other aerocratois in his own way, but not doing well. He finally came home one night with bruised eyes and a bleeding lip. People gathered outside Bob's hut, screaming and shouting at him. Bob said some of his companions listened to him and were sympathetic, but there was the great repair to be thought of, and most ridiculed him for questioning the need to get everything fixed on his ship as soon as possible. They say we have to return to civilization, or our machines will eventually fail us, and we'll all die as savages here on this planet, Bob said. We sat at his small table. I'm really sorry. Bob took a long drink of his liquid. I think they've had enough of me challenging them. I tried to organize, but there are too many of them. I nodded like I understood, but in truth, I was not sure why Bob would try to break the entire process. It served learning well. It served anachoinosis. But I didn't say anything. I did not want to agitate him. I only wanted to learn from him and passed that learning on to all my children. Bob leaned close to me. The people outside, they've come to take me back. Where? I wanted to know. Bob pointed up at the ceiling, indicating the sky above. The ship in the sky. There are places aboard it where I will be frozen again, so I can't speak up anymore. They're putting me back in storage with all the other passengers. New things to learn. I was excited. When do we leave? Bob looked at me strangely. You must do me a favor, he told me. I need you to run out of the door and go towards the forest. I will follow you in a bit. Okay, I said. I think. Bob stared at the door. I think I may have found a way to do something good, something that might help you, something that might help all of us. When I opened the door, twenty loud aerocratois shouted at me. Hey, look, there's one of them. It's his with it. I walked towards them, scared of the yelling. Get him! The nearest aerocratois kicked me. I was lifted up and beaten, tossed from hand to hand. Come over here, we'll show you what for. In seconds, blood ran down my face. How do you like that? My newly regrown fur was torn out of my skin by the angry aerocratois. I barely crawled away from the mob into the grass, and as I collapsed, I heard a loud explosion. Nothing was visibly damaged, but the aerocratois fell silent. He killed himself! One of them shouted, I learned something very new about the Aerocratois. Bob was the only Aerocrat buried in the hill. His white cross was much larger than the other small crosses that covered the grounds. I imitated the shaking and wet eyes ritual he had done before his death and I was alone, my own master. On the second night of being alone, I tried to join in an anachoinosis behind the same hill where Bob had watched us, but was refused. You have nothing new to give, a trio of Whiffets told me. 
and maybe what you bring is bad. They even refuse to let me work with them and learn new things. Among the thousands there, none would look at me. I fled away from the areas near the hopper to go towards the forest. At night, I walked the roads, and during the day I found places to hide and sleep. The forest, when it came up, was welcome. For a whole month, I disappeared into it. There was food in berries and roots. Other animals sometimes came towards me, but I ran from them. They were dangerous and rough. They were not like the docile animals in the land we were taken from to bond with the Aerocratois. My fur soon became shaggy and matted and long. My skin ached for anachoinosis. A gang was working on the edge of a new road. They jumped when I came out from behind a tree. I had visions in my mind of being a master to other Whiffets. I thought about being alone, and that maybe I could spread the memory to other Whiffets. If they were like me, alone and their own masters, but with me, maybe I wouldn't be so lonely. Was this what it was like to be an aerocrat, I wondered? A cool wind blew over us and rustled the fallen leaves on the ground. I held my hands out. Do not be alarmed. Who are you? They wished to know. I showed them my tattoo and told them I had lived near the hopper. Such thick fur, they said. They gathered around me. We have not had time for anachoinosis for a while. We have worked so long and hard. I stroked their arms. Then let us, I said. All of our fur is thick. They found me strange, but relaxed enough to let me into the group. Our egg was thick when it formed on the ground by our feet. We'll give it to our aerocratois, they insisted afterwards. The road was getting hotter as the sun rose higher into the sky. No, I told them. I will take this one. They were shocked. You are too similar. I know. They watched, quiet, as I took our egg with me deep into the forest. When my child hatched several weeks later, he stood up, full with pieces of my own knowledge and the knowledge of the road crews and the knowledge of all their four parents. He didn't bond with me. Just like I had been free since Bob killed himself, my own child was somewhat free. I could see that he was a bit confused, and that he had much on his mind, just as I did. We stood with each other for a long while. We should go find other road crews, my child finally said. If we both have anaquinosis with others, then others can be their own masters with us. I was happy he felt the same way I did, and did not feel so alone. My child told me where the nearest work camps were, and we split company to spread our new revelation. It was a rainy day when I found the work camp. The sun remained almost invisible behind the clouds but it occasionally broke out to illuminate the rows of tents behind the barbed wire. Several aerocratois walked around the edges of the camp, giving orders to the multitudes of whiffets bonded to them. I stopped. I was about to return to being ruled by the aerocratois in there. Maybe it was better to stay in the wilderness, taking eggs from work gangs. It would be better to remain free and spread my memories, then return to a work camp. The memories of my foreparents bonded to Aerocratois overwhelmed me, telling me to return to the camp. The memories of foreparents, who were their own masters, remained distant. It was comforting to think about returning to a work gang, and being told what to do and when to do it. Would I ever be my own master again? 
The desire for anachoinosis tugged at me, and with a strange feeling in my stomach, I walked to the edge of the camp. At the gates, I stood in the mud, and the Erocratois let me in. My fur was thick with dirt. The Erocratois were such exciting creatures. They brought these new concepts, new behaviors, and many other things we never could have come up with. I had so many things to learn from them yet. It was good that I was returning, I reassured myself. There were many whiffets in the camp behind the sharp wires. I hugged the first one to reach his arms out to me, behind one of the tents. I touched his cheeks to mine and shared my memories of my foreparents, my life, and Bob's strange gift to me. I wondered if there would ever be stasis again, now that I was trapped inside the camp working for the Aerocratois again. I hoped my child spread some of the very new thoughts Bob gave me. Those memories would never die but live on. My fur fell to the muddy ground as I gave new memories to another. The next morning I was woken by an aerocrat with red hair. He handed me a pick. We'll be breaking rock today with it. He grinned. <laughs> I was slow to stand up, so he yanked me to my feet with a shout, hurting my arms. As I walked out into the sun, blinking, I knew deep within me that the longer we worked for the Aerocratois, the sooner we would be just like them. Then both would have true anachoinosis. Author's note. Hi, this is Tobias Buckel. Uh, the story Anachnoisis came about because Mike Resnick had asked me to write a short story for I Alien. And when I was looking about for inspiration, I had been recently reading Frederick Douglass's uh, narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, uh, talking about how he went from being a slave in the South to escaping and finding his freedom. But well, one of the interesting things about the narrative, uh, other, you know, other than the fact that Frederick Douglass is an amazing writer that is still quite engaging today, and he was a fantastic orator of the time, is that uh, he's also a very keen observationalist. And one of the things he kept pointing out when he was talking about his time spent in the North versus in the South was that as a result of the focus on slave labor in the South, there was far less uh, invention going on. There was less of a focus on machinery. And the Yankees, as he kept pointing out, would constantly use machines or devices to take up the work of what had been easy and cheap to just force another human being to do. And he was quite amazed by this. And it became this point at which I realized it was really a, an interesting sort of science fictional observation that this over-reliance on manual labor disincentivizes uh, invention and technological advancement. And with that sort of nugget buried in my head after having finished up the narrative, and, uh, narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, I really wanted to uh, experiment with that. And so anachnosis came about with trying to play with, you know, the fact that uh, slavery is just as much a toxic um, creature to the slave owners and the slave society as it is to the slaves. For the slaves, there's the brutality, there's the lack of human rights, there's the lack of civil rights. Um, there's being treated as property and all the horrors uh, that come with that. But above and beyond that, there's also the simple fact that the North and the South in this period are like two different entities completely because of the massive amounts of uh, device making and experimentation and, and forward progress and stronger economy that the North is doing. And looking at this through Frederick Douglass's eyes, I really wanted to do this and and do a science fiction version of it because it just I couldn't get it out of my head. And so when I started to think about the idea of an alien alien, 
I wanted to create something that was alien to us. We know that all slaves would like to be free, but I started to play around with the idea of an alien species that would be a very uh, accommodating towards being enslaved. And I wanted to basically write the story from that alien's point of view, which was the... Uh, which is what we'd been commanded to do for the story. But I also wanted to show the reader that basically this was a really bad, bad, bad thing on, you know, multiple different levels. Um, and mostly I just wanted to fictionalize Frederick Douglass's very fascinating observation. And so the point of the story was, was to point out uh, how this effect then uh, carries on. And it's fascinating that you know whether milder or more virulent forms of slavery have been uh, out there and they've been throughout most of human history uh, it's maybe a point that uh, what, you know one of the reasons uh things move faster in and have moved faster in the western world is the fact that uh calorie power the forcing of humans to do work has be, be, uh, been abolished and you know, in a lot of other societies, manual labor, even like legal manual labor, not slave, slave labor, is still of primacy. And I wonder if that also doesn't have a trickle-down effect. So these these were some of the ideas I was struggling with as I wrote Anachronosis and was trying to demonstrate the the observations that Frederick Douglass had made. And I don't know if it's the greatest job in the world, but I was really struck after I'd finished the story at the uh, sort of emotional impact that I had uh, writing it. It was, it was a somewhat difficult story to write because it's a very difficult subject to tackle, but it was really important. I really wanted to distill this observation that Frederick Douglass made and, and put it into another context because after all, that's, that's what you do a lot in science fiction. You kind of take the mirror that we have held up to ourselves as human beings and reflect something back, you know, and, and the use of future, you know, alien settings is often just a way to, to get this other vehicle. So uh, of all the short stories I've written, this is one of the stories I'm the most proud of. And, you know, it, it just uh, was, was hard to write, but one that I really, really, really am, am Fa just fantastically pleased with the way it turned out. So hope you enjoyed it as much as I did and uh, hope it gave you something to think about and ponder. So let's do a cast list for this story. Do you want to do it in the voice of the Whiffet or... No. I don't think we need to go that far. I, I think people have probably had enough of the voice of the Whiffet. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll find out soon enough. <laughs> okay, so this story's cast is as follows. Wiffit NN721 was played by Big Anklevich. Bob and groups of Wiffits were played by Rish Outfield. Marshall Latham was the voice of Aerocrat number one and the son of NN721. Dave Thompson was Aerocrat number two, a mob member number two, and Workmaster Aerocrat. And Graham Dunlop was Aerocrat number three and mob member number one. Maybe you could put links to their stuff in the show notes. What do you say? Yeah, I'll think I'll throw those in there. Hey, thanks to everybody on this. Yeah. Much appreciated. And thank you, Marshall, again. Okay, here we go. Boy, I've got a buttload of things to say, and it's all story-related for once. Wow, a buttload, huh? Let's start... How large is a buttload? Does, does 08OT know the exact measurement? Yes, it's 3.12. 08OT can measure my ass anytime he wants to. <laughs> oh. Yep, right there, pointed at him. No, we, we, I don't think we have time for interruptions from the friggin' robot. <laughs> First thing, I guess, let's let's tell the story of how we obtained this story. Obtained? You could say that. This is kind of a long and involved saga. Oh, no, no, don't, don't give us a saga, please. Just... Okay, I'll give you the shorter version of the saga. Back in, what was it, 2008? Yes, Two, sir. No, 2009. Okay. Back in November of 2008, uh, we'd just finished our first reading of a story that we'd done for uh, Tony Smith over at Starship Sofa. He enjoyed the reading, so he said, hey, why don't you read these other stories that I've got here for you, too? And he sent us a couple others. He did? Yeah. 
One of them was uh, When Thorns Are the Tips of Trees by Jason Sanford. And then the other one was this story, Anachoinosis. And we got those on the same day. We got those on the same day. And they were both stories that we just really loved. We read When Thorns Are the Tips of Trees first and produced that all up for Tony and sent it off to him. And then while we were waiting to hear back from him, we also read this one. We had it all read and we were ready to start editing on it. And then all of a sudden we got an email from Tony and he said, oh, you know what? Turns out I actually asked somebody else to read that story too, as well as the Jason Sanford story. Sorry about that. So since you guys are already done with Thorns to the Tips of Trees, we'll use your version, but don't worry about anachoinosis. We're going to let this other person do it. And, and to make it up to you, we'll never ask you to work <laughs> on our show again. And so you know, Tony went off to do his thing, and we are like, oh, darn. Well, I tossed our reading in the garbage, put it in the trash can, emptied the trash can out, and it was gone forever. So we sat back and we watched Starship Sofa just to see when this anachoinosis story was going to come out. It was so we could go, oh, our reading was way better than that dude's. Oh, I can't believe that he chose this other guy. We wanted to gloat a little maybe. <laughs> but the thing is, it never came out. It's been two years and it still hadn't come out. And for some reason, the topic came up a little while ago. Rich and I were talking and we said, you know what? We ought to see if we could get that story. I mean, obviously, after two years, it's just not coming. And so I sent Tony an email and I said, hey, dude, I don't think this story's ever going to come out, this one that you once had us read, is it? And he said, oh, you know what? I have no memory of this entire sequence of events. <laughs> he had had a, uh, a hard drive crash. Yeah. And he, according to him, he lost several recordings. He lost... President Obama's birth certificate, and he lost the... Uh, oh, no, that was political. I, I, I take that back. <laughs> he lost the weapons of mass destruction. Oh, the, that oh that's political, political too. too. Uh, he lost... His virginity? Wait, no, we don't want to go there uh, either. Apparently that grew back. <laughs> no, he, he had lost uh, several stories and several readings from people, and then you know any record of stories that he had accepted from people. And so... Yeah, so he had no record of this. The story didn't even sound familiar to him. And he said, yeah, you know what? Go ahead. He said, I have found the cure for the plague of the 20th century, and I've lost it. If you want to do it, that should be fine. And so we sent an email over to Tobias, and... He said, yeah, that sounds great. I'd love to hear your reading of the story. And so here we are, face to face. A couple of silver spoons. <laughs> Come on. We're hoping to find two of a kind. Okay, we're not going to go. Oh, I thought please. the singing episode was last week. <laughs> please. <laughs> please. Just one more line. <laughs> Together. You guys are the all-singing, all-dancing crap of the world. Right. Sorry, announcer man. We just barely recorded the story. And usually what we do is we record it. It's very late at night. We go our separate ways. Uh, but tonight, I was just so filled with impressions and emotions and thoughts during the recording that I said, let's record our episode where we talk about it right now while it's fresh in my mind because I will forget. Uh, we'll get an author's note by Tobias and, and he'll mention Frederick Douglass or something and I'll completely forget what I was thinking when the story was going. But the only thing I remember about the 2008 version was this unusual cadence that you chose to speak <laughs> in. If I recall correctly, and, and I could be wrong, I read When Thorns Are the Tips of Trees, and you read Anachoinosis on the same day. It was like we'd gotten two stories. I'll read this one, you read that one, and we'll get back together when we meet to record and we'll talk about the stories. I had never read Anachoinosis before we recorded it. Mm -hmm. But I do remember When Thorns coming up with voices and things like that as I was reading it. But you had read it previously and you had said it's a first-person alien story and he speaks English, but I think it would be interesting to do maybe not an accent, but an unusual way of talking from the very beginning so that you know that this 
person that is narrating is not human. Right. As far as you remember, was what you did tonight exactly the same as what you did? I, I think so. It was as close. I, I, I vaguely remember how I did it, and I tried to do it as close as I did then. I remember the last time that we read it, I think I kind of got into the rhythm as the story came along. So I think maybe off the top, it probably wasn't as consistent as this version turned out to be. So I think in the end, we probably got a better version of the story than we would have had to begin with. And I'm sure this was much easier, too, than the first time we read it. I think so. It was easier to not trip over sentences because I was saying everything so weird and I had to talk like this. And so I was able to read the words really slowly as I went along, I guess it was. And so I messed up, I think, a lot less often than I normally do when doing a reading of a story for the show. So that was nice. Because, boy, sometimes it seems like I have to read every sentence three times to get it right some days, especially when it gets late at night. Well, maybe we were smart in doing this so early at night. I don't think I've said – well, I mean to the robot I I cursed, but my profanity level has been really low because it's early enough at night – that my mind doesn't instantly go there. <laughs> I've got my deflector shield still up at yeah, maximum. Yeah, still up. Geez, there's so much to talk about. But the character that has no name. He has a tattooed number, though. Do you remember that number? It was NN something. Okay, then. 1701. That does us no good. <laughs> <laughs> These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. But your character was very, at least the way that you read it this time, he seemed so childlike and yeah, it's very naive. simple, but also just very optimistic and kind and uh, eager, eager to learn. And that, and I, I guess we'll just put it out right now. There probably will be people that are irritated by the accent that said, <laughs> "Why didn't you just read it?" I'm sure there will, but to me, it seemed like it had to be done. This is an alien telling us a story in English. But it's an alien. There's got to be something different about this person. And hearing it read in this way, you know this is not just some dude telling you about how he got left in the forest by himself. This is something different. I think it was an unnecessary thing. I mean, you could have just read it, but I don't think it would have worked well. Uh, Usually when you and I record these stories and one of us makes a choice like that, if it seems glaringly wrong... The other person will say, are you sure you want to do it that way? (laughs) We've done that countless times (laughs) where the other person says, are you sure you want to do it that way? And it's our kind way of saying, I don't think that works. (laughs) Right. And to me, there was never a moment like that through the story. I I support your decision wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly even? Well, I wouldn't go that far. But the first time we read it, I remember – trying to mimic your way of talking for the other characters and stuff. And and I did do that tonight, but nowadays, in 2011, we have other people doing all the minor characters. So it's up to Marshall, who produced this episode, whether he tells them, hey, would you try and imitate Biggs reading for the alien voices? And, and, you know, there's some people that just simply won't do stuff like that. You're like, can you read it like this while you're talking? And they're like, no. <laughs> like, oh, okay. But surely one of – maybe not. I was going to say surely one of my voices will still be in there trying to speak in the way that you spoke. And that was really fun. Uh, we had an episode – recently or in the near future where I wanted us all to have an accent and that sort of didn't work out that way. But I like the idea of inventing an accent and saying everybody has to speak in this way. But the character that I played was Bob and I was honored to be able to play this character, a truly decent human being in a society that doesn't prize decency. Something quite unlike yourself. Was that R O O T talking? <laughs> oh, sorry. I thought it would hurt less if it came from me. <laughs> uh, thank you. Somehow it didn't. Oh. Geez, I don't know. This is difficult. I, I almost wish that we could have done this as a short film. This was one of the most cinematic stories that we've ever done. I could see this guy and see him drinking his funny liquids and all that and trying to express to this creature why his attitude was wrong and and that you can't enjoy being exploited. And if you enjoy it, that doesn't make it any less wrong. And 
boy, I'd love to be able to play this guy <laughs> in a, a film version of it. But yeah, very sad to be the one guy. And, and I guess he wasn't because he talked to other people and, and there were some that agreed yeah, with him. He but did get a few he tried to organize. As it often is, the people that agreed don't necessarily do anything about it or they're overshadowed by the many people who disagree. Right. The many loud people that disagree. It's funny. What I thought this story was about while we were reading it was a species that understands true companionship with its own kind on a level that we can't understand learning what it's like to be lonely. That's what I thought that the story was about. Then by the time we got to the end, I thought, okay, the story is not about that, is it? Shoot, it, it's got a nihilistic ending. It, it seems nice, but the worry that Bob had was that they, the Whiffets, would become like us, heartless and selfish, users, lazy, weak. And in the end, the main character just longs for the day when we will all be the same when he will be like us. And, and you know what? I could have totally missed the point on that. Maybe that's not what the story is about at all, but it still bummed me out nevertheless. <laughs> Either of those two things did you feel during the reading? Did you know what inspired the story before we read it tonight? I had listened to it, yes. As soon as he sent it out, I, I listened to it through. And so like when, when we get to the part where Bob goes through and complains about how human beings have stopped advancing. They're stopped moving forward because, you know, rather than fix the tractor, they just hitch a bunch of whiffets up to a harness and use a wagon instead. That's that whole thing that he mentioned that Frederick Douglass had, had said in his book, exactly kind of summed up there. And so, yeah, I, I knew that that was kind of the basis of it, that it was a species that was happy to be in slavery. And somehow they needed to learn that this wasn't a good thing that they were doing. They weren't being treated as equals. They weren't learning in a way. They had to learn through suffering, through tears and bruises and so forth. And the one guy who learned how to drive the big yellow machine, he had to do his anachoinosis quick because it was a dangerous job that he was working in. You know, he could fall off the back of that thing, get run over or something at any moment. And the hill is covered with crosses that represent withets. But in the two years they've been there, not one human being was there. Bob is now the first. And the way he died was by killing himself rather than... Uh, dying and because he was hurt working or had an accident or anything like that. No, that's all left up to the slaves. It Bob killed himself so that he wouldn't have to go back to hibernation or so that his whiff it would be free or as a statement to inspire others that I believe in something so much that I'm willing to die. I think it was a little bit of all of those things. Now, the not having to go back to hibernation, I think he knew that most likely, as he said, the ship was steadily losing power. They were going to have to start thawing people out because they wouldn't have the power to keep them alive up there anymore. And I think he knew that if he was sent back into hibernation, he'd probably never come back out. He had the chance to, rather than just go quietly into the night, I think he was able to uh, make that statement. You know, that this is more important and also set his uh, with it free. So yeah, I think that was what his motivation was behind that. I mean, I don't know. I, uh, I didn't write it, turns out. <laughs> it's, it's a hard story to learn because the main character in C C1701, <laughs> he, he does seem like a child. He's simple. He's eager to learn like children are up until they discover video games and then they don't want anything else. And to see someone like that being abused, especially at the end when the redhead guy grabs him by his arms and flings him or whatever, you know, it, it basically seems like they're using children, you know. These are five-year-olds that they're whipping and getting them in to pull the wagon around or whatever. You know, it's, it's already one of the worst things that human beings has ever done is cause another human being to work in slavery, but add to that making them children that are the slaves, you know, it takes it to another level of monstrosity, I think. 
So it's really difficult to sit through. I mean, these aren't children. They're aliens, but they seem the same to me. For the most part, we, we're shielded from it. We don't get a good account of what these Whiffets are suffering through in their day-to-day -day labor. The closest we ever get is just that last little bit when the redhead guy hurts him because he doesn't get up fast enough. We just get what Bob does, and Bob is a uh, abolitionist, you know. <laughs> he's, he's not going to treat his uh, Whiffet that way. So, yeah, we don't really get the horrors of what it may actually be like. I mean, there, there's a hill full of graves. It does seem as though these aliens are much shorter lived than humans. They do mention that a time or two. So I don't know if they're dying extremely young or just somewhat or what the deal is with that. It's hard to say, but they're definitely dying in a much larger number than uh, the people are. It is a somewhat difficult story to listen through. Experiencing a the black eye of humanity, you know what I mean? It's it's think that kind of stuff still crops up in the world here and there, every, you know, around the, the globe on occasions where there's people that are being forced into slavery. But for the most part, it's something that we've been able to put behind us. We've evolved as a species to where we don't do that anymore. Hey, well, let's let's talk about that if you don't mind. Okay. And again, I I will do whatever I can to not be political. But when we talk about something like this, yeah, there, there's, there's got to be a tiny bit, and it's gonna be. Uh, so let me get it out right here. I am white. I am American, and the thought of owning another human being is repugnant. It's, it's 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 more than repugnant. It's it's unthinkable. It's uh -huh. not something that I could consider. It's something so outside my experience, and I, it's it's something that from when you're you're a very young child is inculcated upon us is that hey that's that's wrong. That's one of the wrongest things uh -huh. that could ever happen, and it has happened. And I believe what you said, we've put it behind us. We've tried to evolve. I, th I think the entire globe has tried to put it in their minds that, hey, that's something that has been done in the past and can never happen again. It it's wrong. You have to know that it's wrong and you have to teach your children that it's wrong. And it, it's, it turns my stomach to think of that, of, of somebody believing that they were so much better than another person that they could use that person as property, you know, work them to death, and et cetera, et cetera. So I would like to believe that we, that I, okay, let, let me say I, would never do that, never. Uh -huh. But let's say that tomorrow there was a new species that came here and they lived to serve and they're not people. They have fur, I don't know how else, the creatures looked. He doesn't they describe were them. He did say they in, were short. You know, what their faces looked like. Good luck, whoever does the episode art. <laughs> but they, these things come and they're not human. So we're able to look at them and immediately say, not us. They're animals. They speak, but they're animals. Mm -hmm. We can do whatever we want to them. Goodbye, five day work week. Goodbye, having to get up when the alarm goes off and go to earn your paycheck. These things have come to be exploited, to make life easier for me. I'd like to believe that I would be Bob and say, no, we have done this in the past. Let's not do it again, please. This thing, the, the, the creature, it looks at me with understanding. It wants to understand. It feels. It reasons. Let's not do this that we have done a hundred times in the past. But Time and time again, you will find fiction, science fiction especially. We've talked about it on the show many times. That the stuff that Escape Pod plays, the stuff that people write, is that human beings are shits. <laughs> and they will continue to be shits a thousand years from now. And definitely the people in this story lean toward that. You know, I don't know. We only ever see Bob and the red-haired guy. Right. And one person that said, he killed himself. And a couple of dudes saying, <laughs> and laughing at the start. But as soon as you can dehumanize someone, then you can excuse any number of atrocities against them. And if a sentient being came and it was not human from the start, it would be so easy. Whether you believe that God put this creature here to serve you, 
whether you believe that evolution has bred us to be masters of this planet, and here come some visitors, but by God, we are still masters. Whatever it might be, the fact that they hunt with spears and we hunt with AK-47s, I'd like to think that I would be like Bob and say, let's teach these things creatures. Let, let's use these creatures as examples of how good humanity is now. And, and let's share with them and let's learn one with another. And let's be like the Star Trek future, <laughs> even though it, the future is now and not one of these post-apocalyptic futures or these earth men or monsters going off. You know, the, the, the line in Avatar where he says, we destroyed our world, and now we want to do the same to yours. You know, there's uh, countless science fiction examples of that, right. where people are just bad. We're like locusts, and we take everything, and then we move on. But I don't know. Right. I don't know that I would be that good, and that's ugly. I don't want to look in the mirror and see somebody that's ugly. I've talked for a long time. You Did you have anything to say on any of that? I mean, you have to look at this face all the time, so you know what true <laughs> ugliness is, but thoughts? Yeah, I totally agree with you. It's hard to know because it is a fantasy situation. What would you do in that situation? But I guess if you tried hard enough, you could come up with a real-life situation that could be put in its place. A real life modern day situation, right? I don't know. I can. I mean, the only thing that I can really think of is that there are countries where, and sometimes even our own country, where children are put to work in. They get paid. They get paid a pittance, but they do get paid, and they're put to work in this place. They're hot. They're awful. They're you know work continually. Don't stop. Get this whatever assembled. Sew these pants. Make these shoes. It, I guess kind of a similar thing. They're doing these, and then they're not doing it gladly. Their life sucks, and they know it. I think, but they do it because it's what there is, I guess. And that's so that we be able to buy an iPod or not an a faux pod for forty dollars instead of having to pay three hundred for it, or a. Yeah. Flirts doll instead of a brat doll. We can get a nice pair of Nikes or whatever, you know, and pay. It seems like they're overpriced, anyways. But <laughs> pay a hundred dollars instead of two hundred for it, or whatever it is. Um, I guess that's kind of a similar thing to this, and it does still happen. And so I guess there is. I mean, there there may be other examples. That's just the one thing I can think of off the top of my head to take this story and bring it back down out of the stars and, and back onto our own planet. And it's out there. It's it's something that happens. And how you fight against that, how, I don't think anyone, this uh, can't even be considered a political thing, I don't think. I don't think there's anyone out there that thinks that sweatshops are, are an okay thing, that we should allow this to go on. It goes on. And sadly, it seems like things like that are happening more and more, you know, or manufacturing jobs leave united states and head overseas because they can make them cheaper out there in the they'll work harder for less various there. other places because yeah they don't have 150 years of unions making sure that workers are watched out for or whatever you know they don't have that history of making sure that the work day is eight hours long and five days a week and etc i guess it's something to consider when you hear this story something you can think about you know, am, am I Bob or am I redhead guy? And that, you know, that's an awful question. The thought that you might be red haired guy. And that sounds like a joke, but I, I don't mean it to be. <laughs> but, you know, you said, OK, well, nobody believes in sweatshops and all that stuff. Yes, that's that's fine. But there's a lot of people. And of course, I'm speaking from a, an American perspective that believe, well, that's on the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. That's thousands of miles away, out of sight, out of mind. Those aren't really people. <laughs> you laugh, but there are yeah. people who would be like, well, when you put it that way. But the whole time, they're like, that's exactly how it is. Right. And to be the most ugly, awful I can be in an episode, and you've heard me be ugly and awful, what if... I had been born during America's early years in a place where slavery was a way of life. 
you know, of course I think I would be one of those guys. It's like, no, no, look, we bleed the same color. We, 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 we are human beings. I could get with that woman and we could have a child together. We are the same species. But what if I just accepted it like everybody else? What if I right. looked and said, you know, and we may be the same species, but different shaped nose, different shaped hair, not the same. Me good, them bad. That, to me, that's just ghastly that I could think that, but, but I don't know. Yeah, I, you don't know until you've been there, and so the, yeah, it's just, you yeah. have to work against it. I think that's why change in society takes so long, is because you have to, you know, fight against those things that they're ingrained. That's the way we've been taught, or or it's just the way it's always been. Those people always served us, or, or whatever. And there are those people that are able to see beyond that, and they're always the smaller minority. It seems that uh, work against those things and eventually things change and uh, we're able to see these others as people instead of as animals or bad things you know we're able to see beyond that and see that these are people too and they deserve the same that we get the same rights and, and yeah at some point that's what will have to happen it is easy to you know, these people that make these things are on the other side of the world. We don't know. We've never met any of them. We don't see any of them. Sometimes I think it would be a good thing for every person to just be forced to go to some other country and spend a year or two living in some country that's completely different than their own, just so that they see that there's more out there than their own neck of the woods. And they're able to experience things and know that, uh, Everything isn't exactly as it is uh, in their neighborhood. I think a lot of people that don't ever get that experience kind of have that closed-minded or it's like they have the blinders on, you know, that the horses uh, would wear to keep them from being spooked and scared into, you know, running off crazy. They want to see the stuff on the sides of them that isn't what they should see. And sometimes I think the blinders really need to be taken off so you can see a wider view of the way things are and be able to know that it's not the same not everybody is just like you and uh, the other people on your street, but there's so much more out there. Things are different everywhere, and uh, solutions to things can be found a lot better the more understanding of others' conditions that we have. But uh, it takes experience. It takes uh, effort, and effort is something that uh, a lot of people, including myself, <laughs> try to avoid. I mean, we, we've talked over and over again about uh, writing and that it's hard. It takes effort. You know, it's not toiling in the sun, digging a ditch, but it's hard. It takes thought. It takes effort. It's easier to avoid. It's easier to just sit on your couch, watch TV or play video games or whatever than to go out and learn things and to strive to make the world better. But uh, the world could be better. And... Uh, it always starts with one person, I guess, like Bob. I want to sound preachy or whatever, but you could be the one person that starts it. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be the other guy that starts it and you join in. You could be the one. I must have been on Disney Channel when my kids were watching it or something like that. You know, they, they talked about some kid who discovered that uh, there was a problem. You know, they, this I've, I've seen probably five or six different commercials or PSAs or whatever this is about. A little kid, eight, ten years old, something like that, saw that there was some problem. And rather than think, well, that's too bad, they decided to do something about it. And this little ten-year-old kid started up a foundation that collected whatever and did these things for these people and changed the world a little bit. And if a 10-year-old kid can do it, then anybody can. It's all, you know, takes the effort. I know what you're talking about with not wanting to work, not wanting to, uh, what was the word you said? Effort. Not wanting to put effort in. But it's, it's weird how this story has affected me. <laughs> but I'm thing... going to go start a paper route right now. What? That's Pee Wee Herman. <laughs> oh. Another thing that this story sort of inspired in me is I was like, oh gosh, I'd love to get out there and write something that could affect somebody else the way that this story has uh -huh. affected me. That could be like, uh, you know, the, there are many ways to do it and that could be the way that you affect people. We've had dealings with other writers of 
Tobias's stature that haven't been as kind to us. I mean, we don't pay anything. Uh, I w- I'd like to change that, but we don't. I-, I really appreciate him letting us do this story. I had forgotten. It's been a long time and I've lost a lot of brain cells, but uh, it- this was a really good story. It is. Thank you, uh, Tobias. You don't know us, but thank you for letting us do this story anyway. I hope we did it justice. And I hope somebody else out there liked what we did and that, you know, we weren't talking about comic books and Star Wars and Firefly and dildos and stuff afterward this time. Next week we will, I promise. But uh, I don't know, good stuff. And and it's not always just a person's sacrifice or a person's example that can inspire others. Sometimes it is art. Right. A, a song can move people. A play can inspire people. A book can get people up on their feet and working in their society to make things better bringing to light Uncle Tom's Cabin, something like that, that people read that and say, I didn't know that that's what it was like. This can't stand. And other people being inspired by that same, you know, it's it's neat that art can do that. So again, thank you. And and you know what? Thank you, uh, Marshall, for producing this episode. We just... uh, I forgot about him because I, I I had so much stuff. I wanted to talk about the loneliness thing and now I'm not going to. It's just <laughs> this really lit a fire under me. I don't know if you felt the same way. You were probably so busy reading the text. <laughs> but I Trying just, to keep up that goofy uh, cadence. But it's good stuff. Gosh, I want to write something that good. All right. Well, get to work as soon as you get home. I want you to start at 3 a.m. I don't care. <laughs> All right. Well... I think we've uh, run our course for today. I agree. Hey, it's been a good run. It's been a, it's been a good two years and two months since we read this the first time. <laughs> right. In a way, I mean, it's been crappy too, but for the show, <laughs> uh, it's been really cool. I feel like this is our last episode. It's been an honor serving with you, sir. <laughs> Make it so, number one. Engage. All right. Well, thanks for listening. We'll see you all again next time. Uh, Have a wonderful time. Start with the man in the mirror. (laughs) Good night. See you later, folks. Thanks for listening to The Dune Steve. Please donate, folks. It'll help us pay our authors. And isn't that what it's all about? The Dune Steef is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Scarecrow, I think I'll miss you most of all. Take two. Bob, one of the Aerocratois pointed at me. This is your whiffet. My what? This is... The way you're going to do it from here on out? Anacoinosis by Tobias S. Bacal. Now do that part in a real regular voice. Hell no. Please. Really? You want me to do it in a regular voice? Dirt caked my hands as I dug in. Dugged. Clay dagger. Clay dagger. These random characters, I'm sure like Marshall can voice one or... Marshall, Marshall, Marshall. <laughs> Why do you have to compare me to him? Bob, this is your whiffet. My what? I, see, you have a, a accent. Are you going to do that accent the whole time? You sound like a southern guy. My right. what? You're going to do the southern accent? Well, I don't understand. Where does this take place? What? It takes place on an alien world. Well, hopefully all southerners will have died out by the yes. time we've colonized other alien worlds. Right. It is merely indentured servitude. Look, the leaders of the Whiffets gave us their young willingly in exchange for the technology we gave them. It's a fair trade. That is so awesome. No, it isn't. You hate that. Use that voice. Don't you dare edit it out by putting some reasonable sounding voice in there. Okay. Well, that's a high pitched version of what you were doing. You realize that, right? <laughs> what? That's supposed to be a human, not a. Oh, Eric Roy are human beings. I'm sorry.
Oh, yeah, it was making me laugh. You did that. You did that like, you shouldn't have tried to leave. No one gets away from the high. It was that voice from the Kevin Anderson story. <laughs> that wasn't a story. Okay, sorry. The, the poem. <laughs> you know, it's kind of easier to read a story when you... I mess up on this less often, it seems, than I normally do, because I don't have to put, like, human feeling into it. I have to be all goofy. Either people will praise us wildly for the reading, or, or they won't. what will actually happen. And the fur on top of his head was unkempt. Should I say kempt or kept? Kept is, unkempt is not a word, right? It's not, but I, it makes much more sense than unkempt. <laughs> but it's still not a word. Should I say unkempt? Because it is a word? It's up to you. I would leave unkempt because I think unkempt is a fucked up word that shouldn't exist. <laughs> it shouldn't exist. Kempt is not a word. And unkempt would be the opposite of kempt. Uh -huh. I'll bet it's, it should have been unkempt uh, 200 years ago and it somebody misspelled been. it and now we all say unkempt. It's just somebody with an accent kept putting the M sound in unkempt. Like, no, dude, it's uncapped. I extended my forearm to show him the numbers on it. N, N, 7, 2, 1. I am the Starship Enterprise. What is Starship Enterprise? It's 1701. Well, I'm sorry. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm sure. I don't know. It's this thing claims uncolored is not a word. Racial slur, I guess. Should have a U in it. That's the problem. Whoa, that's oh, actually one of the suggestions. <laughs> you take that back right now. The engineers drop down planet side near the best resource. Ri the engineers drop down planet side near the best resource. Resource. The engineers drop down planet side near the best resource. Resource. <laughs> do, I to, do I need to change it so that you'll? <laughs> Thanks. What is wrong with marvelous? Two L's. Friggin, well, I love that's... British um, English, but dude, there, we don't need two L's in that word. Maybe I accidentally uh, switched some preference over to British English or something on here. Oh, okay. Sorry. I will share what I have learned about your ships in the sky and your prediction of more of your kind coming to live with us. Among us. Among us. That's amazing that you can just do that because uh. it's weird way that the story is structured <laughs> you don't have to redo the sentence you can just say among us i probably will anyways though because that's my way i turned away from them and grabbed the arms of the other the threesome was something else <laughs> and felt my skin stir I couldn't say that without making it all. Felt my skin stare. <laughs> Wait, which state is number one for bestiality? <laughs> that was uh, Washington, I think. My skin ached for anachoinosis. I really wanted to get off. I spread my arms. Those are happy times, I said. There's only... Is one thing you need in life and to make make you happy, and that is friends. So if you have friends, you will be a happy, happy, happy person. You, you also need the food and clothes. You need, you need food and clothes, and you need the friends and the food and clothes. Then you'll be a happy person. Okay. And, and a nice car. I gotta say, buddy, I'm trying really hard to channel my inner Josh all the way here, but um, I'm I may not be the best redneck ever. Well, let's talk about it. Let's do an episode. Oh, wow, my eyes are burning. You shouldn't have seen that movie where Kathy Bates is naked. The sooner we would be just like them, then both would have true anachronosis.
There you go. Anachoinosis. Big and rich. Thank you so much. This is Starship Sofa. Good night from me. <sighs> Whoa. Is that a dream? Oh, I don't know what came over me. Sorry, guys. It's late. It's funny because I checked with the author. I asked him, how do you pronounce the name? Is, is there a certain way to pronounce it? Or are you happy with whatever we come up with? And he told us, fuck you. <laughs> Not quite that. <laughs> with it, NN721 was... I'm sorry, what was that? <laughs> this is kind of a long and involved saga. Don't make it a saga, please. I'm not gonna. I don't even know what a saga is, except for that it bothers me. Drama and saga both really bother me. Yeah.